Applebee's, a once-thriving restaurant chain, has left an indelible mark on the American dining landscape. Applebee's has embodied the spirit of casual eating throughout its history. From its modest beginnings as a small restaurant, with a vision for accessible and affordable dining, to its rapid climb to become a beloved staple in towns across the United States. However, it encountered various difficulties, going through a slump that made people worry about its future just like many businesses do. We will explore the highs and lows of Applebee's, dissecting the elements that led to its ascension and its struggles. But what specifically caused Applebee's fantastic rise, subsequent decline, and final resurgence? The ownership of Applebee Company has changed several times throughout its existence. To understand how the corporation changed during these times, looking at each ownership change is crucial. The Applebee's we are familiar with today traces back its origins to the partnership of Bill and T.J. Palmer. They embarked on a culinary journey by inaugurating their inaugural restaurant, T.J. Applebee's Rx, for edibles and elixirs, in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1980. The success of this venture led to the birth of a restaurant concept that aimed to provide a family-friendly neighborhood-style dining experience with a diverse menu to cater to various tastes. And you're going to enjoy its original name. Initially, they wanted to name it Applebee, spelled with a Y, but they couldn't because the name was already taken. They considered Apple Bay, but it was taken too. So they settled for TJ Applebee's RX for culinary delights. It started as a family-owned restaurant near Atlanta, Georgia in the early 80s, but it was sold to W.R. Grace and Company in 1983 due to disagreements between the owners. W.R. Grace and Company used franchising to expand the business, eventually having 54 locations. William Palmer was one of the franchise owners. He continued to work with Applebee's even after selling the company and was a consultant until he died in 2020. Their challenge was an inability to devise a strategy that made the company consistently profitable. We have to assume that Applebee's continuously caused W.R. Gray's losses in revenue, which was a significant factor in their choice to give up in 1988. John Hamra and Abe Gustin were the buyers, which looked obvious given their previous connections to Applebee's. Another of these franchisees, Gustin, was in charge of six of his personal Applebee's restaurants, while Hamra served as the board's chairman. So there's a tiny technical shift to be mentioned. The procedure of becoming a publicly traded company using the stock market which started by Applebee in 1990. To ease the company's financial obligations, Hamra and Gustin ultimately decided to conduct an initial offering to the public. This choice signaled an era of change in the 1990s and significantly increased their standing among consumers. They had around 100 sites at the beginning of the period, yet by the very end of it, they had more than 1,000. It's essential to highlight that they stayed devoted to retaining the initial concept amidst the growing number of locations in an increasing number of areas, diligently cultivating that welcoming and neighborly ambiance. Their extensive growth enabled them to increase revenue greatly. They permitted decisions to be made at the restaurant level extending to matters like decor and even the selection of menu offerings. The business would list approved food items available while stipulating that at least 65% of the available choices should be made of staples like fried chicken and pork. A second list with a range of regional favorites could fill the balance of 35% of the order. Despite becoming the type of massive franchise business that William Palmer had first aimed to set Applebee apart from, it retained its distinctive flavor. Idea persisted successfully nearly the 2000s, although most data shows that problems started to appear in the years before 2006. Several vital indicators support this assertion, such as the decline in their earnings, a slower growth rate in comparable store sales, and the shift towards negative figures by that particular year. The fact that much of their industry was experiencing unfavorable economic conditions at the time may be a simple and apparent reason for everything, but ultimately, it resulted in their last and, arguably, most significant ownership transition. IHOP paid $2.1 billion for the purchase of Applebee's in 2007. They had to incur a sizable debt to execute this transaction, primarily since Applebee's, with almost 1,900 destinations, was bigger than IHOP. Let's look more closely at the unusual circumstances behind this acquisition, notably those involving Julia Stewart, the CEO of IHOP. 
The purchase of Applebee's gave her already inspirational story a new dimension of depth, adding a fascinating element to her path. Julia Stewart had been an IHOP waitress when she was a teenager. Then she made a complete turnaround by rejoining the corporation as its new chief executive officer in 2003, a few decades later. IHOP faced significant challenges upon arriving, but her strategic turnaround plan was pivotal in their recovery. At the heart of the strategy was the choice to sell off all business-owned IHOP stores and switch to an almost entirely franchised system. They wasted no time unveiling their new tagline, Come famished, leave satisfied. Their income flow improved. They were able to protect themselves from the turbulence of the market for real estate, and they were free to focus more on enhancing the dining experience at their restaurants because they're no longer in charge of those locations. Delving deeper into the narrative, it's essential to note that before taking on the role of CEO at IHOP, Julia Stewart has previously served as the president of Applebee's domestic division. She decided to leave the company and accept the post at IHOP after discovering that she had been passed over for the CEO position at Applebee's, a place she felt she earned. When IHOP was thriving and Applebee's was struggling in 2007, Julia Stewart and the firm thought that they could save Applebee's by following the effective procedure they had just implemented in IHOP. In conclusion, Julia Stewart strongly desires to change Applebee's and a tried-and-true strategy for doing so. The recession immediately began the purchase and significantly complicated the situation, preventing the entire process from going as planned. It was a difficult task. Yet, they managed to maintain a relatively stable course while transitioning into a fully franchised structure by 2015. However, shortly after, their situation took a turn for the worse, surpassing previous challenges. The main problem in this case likely arose from the reality that Julia Stewart and the other Applebee staff members developed an intense obsession with the need to attract a younger clientele. Their strategy in this context encompassed selling higher quality food, revamping the locations with a more modern eye aesthetic, and adopting a heightened focus on health-conscious offerings. However, implementing these changes eroded the cherished sense of a friendly neighborhood establishment. Their prices increased and, as a result, their long-standing loyal older customers started to feel alienated. During this period, wood-fired grills were installed across multiple Applebee's restaurants for $75 million. As the name suggests, these grills utilize the flames generated by the wood for cooking food. They were primarily intended for preparing the higher-grade hand-cut steaks that Applebee's was introducing as part of their menu upgrades. It's obvious now that the entire project was foolish. Their middle ground standing was improved, elevating them to a more expensive category. However, this turned off their existing client base and did little to attract the younger generation, confusing the public about their brand and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. The situation was such a catastrophe that Julia Stewart resigned from her long-held position shortly after, arguably marking Applebee's lowest point. Nevertheless, as alluded to, brighter days were on the horizon. Subsequently, they appointed a new CEO, Steve Joyce, who promptly set out to undo many of those changes to steer the company back to the middle ground. The dollarita that they produced made a significant impact. Other cheap drinks were added, always emphasizing the reasonable cost and establishing themselves as a value-driven business. These changes contributed to a rise in their same-store sales. They effectively halted the downward spiral after the unfortunate introduction of the hand-cut steaks, a much-needed break for the company. Naturally, we cannot guarantee that all their issues have been fixed. However, they have made significant improvements that move them in a much more positive direction. The story of Applebee's offers a priceless lesson for the restaurant industry, emphasizing the significance of maintaining one's primary identity while adjusting to the shifting customer preferences. Watching how the business develops as it moves forward according to the constantly changing demands of the eating sector will be fascinating. What do you think of Applebee's journey so far? And have any of these adjustments been made at your neighborhood Applebee's? Feel free to comment below with your ideas or dining experiences. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you can stay updated with more insightful content.